Hello and welcome to our Shield Harper information series. Uh, today we are joined by our director of enterprise sales, Matthew Schusler. Hello, Matt. How are you? Hi, Frank. So our fearless leader uh, contacted us and uh, started brainstorming ideas to put out more information uh, to our customers that relates to our field. Almost immediately you responded back with sizing submersible turbine pumps. Seemed like something that you were eager to get out there. So here we are today talking about sizing submersible turbine pumps. And before we get to that, Matt, I uh, thought it might be a good idea for you to introduce yourself and maybe explain why you are uniquely qualified to talk about this subject. Thanks, Frank. I don't know if I'm uniquely qualified, but thanks for the, the pre-credential, I guess, there. Um, yeah, I'm Matt Schusler. I'm the Director of Enterprise Sales here at Shields Harper & Company. And um, I know the standard bio says, you know, years in the industry. I've got 30 years of experience in the industry. I came in through a technical capacity as a field technician once upon a time. And I've worked for a couple of manufacturers, a major oil refiner, a jobber, and a couple of distributors along the way. So um, I don't know how to play every instrument in the orchestra to proficiency, but um, but I've had enough experience. I kind of know how the pieces come together in, in the oil business and construction of sites. And the reason that um, this subject was sort of instantaneous to me, Frank, is that you know you pay attention to things that maybe happen frequently or don't go as well as they should have. And pump sizing is something that um, sort of like old habits die hard. And with my 30 years, I remember the way it was done back in the day um, and, and a little bit of why, and that's changed now. So that's part of the story here. And it's important to get the word out for folks building new fuel systems with, in this context, gas and diesel at least, to say measure twice and cut once. You're gonna spend mm -hmm. a lot of money building a site, tremendous amount of money. And you have one chance to get something really right at the the start, which is the, the the pump sizing, which is a little bit like sizing the engine in, say, you're buying a truck and say, you know, are you going to just drive around the street or are you going to haul a boat trailer over a mountain range? You might make a different decision, right, Frank, about the power plant in that truck. It's going to influence what you're doing. Similar, that's the best analogy I can think of here. So if you just figured, well, you know, my first truck had four cylinders. 30 years ago. Uh, I guess I can buy a new four cylinder truck like I always did, um, but your but your need is different. That would be a really poor decision. That's kind of the analogy. Yeah, sure. It, it seems like uh, it's as important to a uh, fueling station setup as just about any other piece of equipment that you're going to put in. Um, so it makes sense to me why uh, you might want to spotlight this particular equipment. Um, and like you mentioned, you know, I, I know you work with Franklin and, and that is one of their specialties is is the uh, submersible turbine pump. So I uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, I know that you have some stuff to share with us, uh, so I'm not sure if you wanted to jump into that right now or if you wanted to give us a little bit of background about uh, the specifics of sizing submersible turbine pumps. Yeah, why don't we do both? So since you just mentioned Franklin, I think in full disclosure, um, I was employed by Franklin Fueling Systems from 2008 until the end of last year, 2020. So about a 13 year span in, in a predominantly in a sales sales management capacity. Uh, for those that are not as familiar with Franklin Fueling Systems, um, they actually have their lineage tracing back to the origin of FE Petro submersible pumps. And in um, this market, and at least North America, there really are only two submersible pump manufacturers for gasoline. We should name them both. One is FE Petro, which is just said part of Franklin Fueling Systems. And the other is Red Jacket Pumps, which today is owned by the, the group that is known as Gilbarco Viterut. So uh, both pumps, great products, and uh, there are some nuances between the two of them, but today's discussion is really functional and, and uh, sort of classroom related to uh, sizing. So what we're talking about today would apply equally, whether the pumps are red or blue, as we would say, red jacket or FE Petro. Good to know. And with that said, um, I will go ahead and jump to uh, material that anyone can access in the public domain, Frank. It's 
on in this case using the FE Petro references since I'm more familiar with them. Uh, but in Franklin's website, www.franklinfueling.com, or a Google search for FE Petro um, and the flow curves, and they're in their published catalog. So this material is not even a technical bulletin or manual. And you'll see here that um, I've just put on screen as a beginning point the flow curves from Franklin's catalog for the three quarter horsepower fixed speed pump. And you might ask why begin there? There actually is a smaller size, a one third horsepower, but I mentioned a moment ago, Frank, in my career, there really was a time 30 years ago, there were still a handful of, you know, albeit smaller mechanically equipped gas stations that had this size pump. And I begin here because I've highlighted for our audience that this little circle, and let me explain this, we have an X and an Y, axis here of the flow curves and you'll notice that rising vertically you have the total head hydraulic head is a term you can google um, it it begins at the sort of literal interpretation of like how many feet would you be lifting the fuel like a well if you have a 50 foot deep well you obviously have to lift the water 50 feet to get it to grade and then turn horizontally presumably and pump it into a house or a building with a gas station we're not going to have 50 feet of depth. Um, most underground storage tanks are today eight or 10 foot diameter. They're typically buried about four to six feet depth, you know, four to five being an average. So if you added that up, Frank, you know, say 10 foot tank, four foot deep, it's 14 feet of vertical lift to grade. Um, then, however, from that point, the discharge of the pump downstream to the fuel dispensers, those those sites, the piping layout, the size, the length of the run, the number of turns and bends, these all come into the calculations of what your your actual flow will be at the nozzle, not the least of which is also the type of dispenser, its internal hydraulics, and then lastly, the hanging hardware, the you know what what size and diameter and length um, of hose, you know, uh, you can guess a, a a 20 foot long, 5 8 inch diameter, say conventional hose is probably going to be more restrictive than a 8 foot long, 3 quarter inch diameter conventional hose. Um, so the point in that is that as we get in this discussion about hydraulic head and, and, and the resulting flow rate, all of this information can be fed into actual mathematical models that both uh, Red Jacket and FE Petro offer as a free service to customers. So if nobody, uh, if they say, if you forget everything else you learned here today, just know that both manufacturers want to earn your business. And if you give them a site layout with the details I just mentioned, they will professionally calculate with modeling software to say, based on this, your pump size and all the other things, here's what you'll expect at the nozzle. So what we're going to do is a more rudimentary begin at the beginning and kind of work our way into, well, what's the output capacity? Hey Matt, so, let me let me pause you there real quick. I just want to make sure that I'm 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 hearing you correct and clarifying what we're looking at here. So when you're when you're sizing the pump for a, a gas station setup or a fueling setup, you're not just uh, taking into account how much uh, length it is to take the fuel from the underground tank up into the turbine, you're actually calculating the entire length of where the fuel sits underground or yeah, underground and to the point where it exits the nozzle into the customer's fuel tank in their vehicle. That's correct? That's exactly right, Frank. So I'm glad you said it. So think of it this way, quite literally, the point to point run is from the inlet of the submersible pump motor, which is typically about four to six inches off the bottom of that tank to the tip of the nozzle spout in the vehicle. That is the entire hydraulic run. So everything that goes into the composition of that will affect the resistance and therefore interactively with either upsizing a pump or adding additional pumps to achieve the flow rate at the nozzle. Does that help? Yeah, no, that helps. It, it, it uh, clears that up. I, I really, uh, you know, I hadn't thought of that when when talking about uh, submersible pumps. You know, all I really take into consideration is the fuel and uh, how many dispensers there's going to be. So you size it that way. But when you put it in, in scale of the entire project, it really changes how you look at it. 
That's right. So hopefully, in addition to what we said about hoses, the same would be said with the piping system, Frank. It's a big component. It's like the arteries of if this were blood flow. The pump, it, you know, sort of like the heart muscle, and then all the arteries are going to the extremities of the body, and and the blood has to flow further from your heart to your tippy toes than maybe to your elbow, right? That kind of thing, and maybe we'll encounter more restrictions. So go with that. But the point being then, we really begin at the end and we want to design sites with a target flow rate that we, we want to achieve. That's our performance standard. So let's start with that. And though I don't have a slide to show it, I think most people watching this will probably know that in the United States, it is law from the Environmental Protection Associate, uh, Agency, sorry, the EPA, that gasoline in a retail application shall not be pumped at a rate faster than 10 gallons per minute at the nozzle. So we that's our gold standard, right? In a perfect world, right, we would try to deliver 10 GPM at every nozzle, at every gas station for any customer so they have the best customer experience and the faster transaction time. And on that note, um, that cycle time for retailers, the more people you can get out the door, Frank, in a given hour of business or peak traffic, is not just the gallon sold, that's sort of a no brainer as they say, but hopefully for the customers shopping the store, you get more transactions of people going in your doors where there are respectable margins on you know, goods being sold there and the merchants want that. So everyone should be thinking pump sizing has big ramifications. If you can, if you can turn more sales cycles, uh, it pays in a few different ways, right? And conversely, if the flow rates are slow or underperforming, you get less of both of those things, uh, wet sales and dry sales, if you will, and you may be bad enough a customer's bad experience may send them to one of your competitors. So, so pump sizing is far reaching. And so looking at the curve behind me, starting with this three quarter horse fixed speed motor, these are rarely used today unless it's a very small site of a couple nozzles and let's explain why. So let's pretend this is gasoline. Now, we mentioned the 10 foot tank and the four foot burial depth and then all the other stuff the fuel has to flow through hydraulically till it reaches that nozzle tip. A good approximation that's often used is an average of around 60 feet of hydraulic head for most sites. Again, if you want accurate uh, you know, really dialed in model, go to the manufacturer. But for today's purpose, let's stick with 60 GPM, or sorry, 60 feet of head across our spectrum. So if we look at the curve for the three quarter horse pump motor at 60 feet of head, and we follow it down to the gallons axis, we can see that intersects the line at about 45 gallons per minute. Going back to what we said about if this is gasoline, and we're gonna hit a ceiling of 10 GPM per nozzle, you can extrapolate, Frank, that this pump would be adequate for a little more than four nozzles if they're all in use simultaneously, which would be just a two dispenser site, dual-sided dispensers, four sets of hanging hardware, four times 10 is 40, and it's a good fit. So said another way, if you're building a site that's more than two dispensers in today's world, um, you probably can already tell if, if you went with a three quarter horse pump, you'd be undersized. Don't see a lot of three quarters nowadays. If we scroll down the next size sort of in the food chain here with, with both uh, Epi Petro and Red Jacket would be the horse and a half. In my career, this was really the workhorse for most of the sites in the 90s. Um, and a lot of reasons it was just because it was the, it, it was the thing that sold. Quickly, let's jump over and see the same reference. So we're consistent in this presentation. At 60 feet of head, the horse and a half pump intersects the line at about 70 gallons a minute. So we just went from 45 to 70. I wanna point out to everyone listening, notice we did not go from 45 to 90, Frank. It didn't just double. And there is a misconception out there if you haven't studied the curves that double the horsepower, double the output. It's a logarithmic function and it's not linear like that. It doesn't work that way. So it is improved. It, 70 is 35 gallons a minute more than 45 at the same reference. Uh, so I haven't done the math on that. That's like what a 75% improvement, but it's not doubling. Now we do the same thing. 
always remember just divide by 10 per nozzle. 70 gallons divided by 10 would feed about seven nozzles if everyone was in simultaneous use. So for a four dispenser site with eight sets of hoses, that would be 80. 70 is pretty darn close. And if you go, well, I don't ever really have all eight nozzles in use, horse and a half is not a bad fit for you in that application. Now, Matt, let me stop you real quick there. Uh, let's say you have a setup that is that looks like three dispensers that's going to give you six nozzles if they're both dual sided dispensers and you're still running at 70 gallons per minute. If you're over that 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 threshold of 10 gallons per minute per nozzle, is that going to be an issue? You know, I'm glad you asked that, Frank, and that would have been an issue in the day because dispensers used to have no ability to self-regulate their flow and in fact still available on the market today are mechanical physical um, hose restrictors flow limiters that can be attached to hanging hardware to slow it down which is really counterintuitive when we're trying to have better performance there are still some out there so i'm glad you asked that uh, the the Dispenser manufacturers of today, the, the brands I think are all known, but let's do them service for uh, for Wayne, Gilbarco and Bennett. Use a type of sophisticated electronics, whether blending or non-blending dispensers that have dynamic flow control. So it's programmable, Frank, and you tell that dispenser what the ceiling is so it behaves. And that, that way you tell it don't ever exceed 10 GPM and they can in real time see the pace they're dispensing at and throttle down those valves so that they stay compliant. And that's good, it's peace of mind to the retailer and it addresses what you're implying, which is we have a floor and a, we have a ceiling and a floor and we wanna drive the capacity hydraulically so that we get that optimal output with out violating the EPA rule. So, so a modern dispenser, your analogy, three dispensers, six hoses, 70 GPM gives us a little bit of headroom. We get that 60, we're safe in that. Um, and whereas if you went with a three quarter, you're only gonna ever get 45, you would be underperforming. So, so having a little built-in uh, overhead in the pump sizing is uh, never a bad thing. You don't want it to be excessive, uh, but, but in this case, simple answer, horse and a half would be perfect for a three dispenser site. Thanks for answering that. So if, the, if this setup were, if this uh, horse and a half turbine were to be set up in our previous example with two dispensers, it would be a bit overkill then, yeah? Yeah, it really would because two dispensers said we need 40, you know, it wouldn't be terrible for future growth. If the customer said, you know, Frank, I may add a dispenser or two down the road, that's in my plan, we're gonna add an island or whatever, let's go ahead and do this now. Um, 70 is not so excessive that those two dispensers, if they have, you know, dynamic flow control or a hose restrictor, couldn't deal with that as well. And of course, you know, motors can be swapped subsequently. So even changing the motor in the tank is not a, it's not a big ordeal. Understood. Okay, so that's the horse and half, which was the workhorse in my era, predict, particularly because, let's be honest, gas stations tended to be more mechanical, less restriction, shorter runs, and, and not as many big footprint sites with lots and lots of dispensers and lots and lots of cars. So as the economy and the world have changed, the, the pump sizes have also sort of gotten bigger, and we'll talk about redundancy in a moment. But first, before I transition to the next pump size, I should mention um, in fixed speed pumps, we haven't even talked about variable, Frank, there are standard pressure and low pressure. And you'll notice here, or sorry, standard pressure and high pressure, I take that back. And here is the same size motor, horse and a half, but it's declared as a high pressure. In a fixed speed pump, that means there are more um, layers in the stack of the pump, like the impellers that, that, that increase or ratchet up the output. And if we, I didn't draw it out, but if we follow the curve here on the horse and a half high pressure fixed pump, the same 60 feet ahead crosses over here at um, about, oh, what is it, maybe 55 gallons per minute, which if you're paying attention, you go, well, wait a second, that's less output than the 70 we just saw. And Frank, here's another point people miss so much. 
High pressure pumps, you'll notice the head curve starts way up at 140, where just a moment ago, our curve started at about 105, let's call it. So um, high pressure fixed speed pumps are really intended for what this graph shows. When you really do have a lot of lift to overcome uh, or a very, very obstructive site. So said simply, their best application has traditionally been generator fuel systems on top of multi-story buildings where we're literally pumping the fuel up several floors to get it where it needs to go to maybe a day tank you know on the eighth floor of the building yeah um, sure I, I could see how just the words high pressure might be a little bit misleading as to what this turbine is capable of Correct. Yeah. So so they have their part in the market, but they're really not the right application, frankly, for most retail sites. They're they're more of a commercial industrial application, generally speaking. Now, with the advent of bigger and better um, in the fixed speed category also is this now two horsepower curve. Same process at 60 feet ahead as a good average, it produces about 80 GPM. So we went from horse nap at about 70 to two horse at about 80, about a 10 GPM lift. Technically a little better fit for that four dispenser eight nozzle site because we're right at 80 if, if potentially all nozzles are to be used. Now in this point in the presentation, it's probably a good idea to mention something I have ignored so far, which is this dashed line on each curve if you go to twin pumps, if you go to manifolded, so we have a pair of pumps in the same piping system driving, running simultaneously. Now here is where you see the doubling effect, right? So if I take a pair of two horse pumps and we follow the curve at 60 feet and we come across here to the dash line, we'll see that lo and behold, we jump all the way from 80 GPM to a little above 160. Basically, it's a 2X. So this site with twin pumps could do 160 divided by 10 or 16 nozzles. So Frank, for a modern big footprint, you know, maybe Southern Cal where you live, uh, eight dispenser site, they they can't get the flow rate they need out of a single pump. It requires twin pumps. And furthermore, you have redundancy. So the beauty of the modern site with twin pumps is if one pump were to die, you're going to cut back to half capacity, half flow, but everybody can still get their fuel. And you have time as the service provider responds to replace, say, a dead motor that you're not just you know, down for the count. It's a really important thing and it's often overlooked. Uh, this would be the highlight of our presentation today where I have seen sites constructed in our state, Frank, sadly, where somebody didn't measure twice and they just, you know, said, hey, we'll throw in a two horse, that's good. Not really doing the math to realize for say even six dispensers, right? 12 nozzles, that that's, that's insufficient as you can see on these curves. Yeah, so if I'm if I'm extracting the uh, the key point here is that if if you are going to need higher flow uh, in gallons per minute, it's not necessarily uh, that you need to increase your uh, size of your motor, but perhaps adding another motor gives you the higher flow that you're looking for. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right. So, so looking over my 30 year career, you know, again, there was a time where a horse and a half single quantity was arguably enough or even more than enough for so much of what was needed in the market then. But times have changed and with big sites and just the business need of redundancy. Even if you have redundant pumps, Frank, that operate independently, which is a configuration option, you you have a backup, uh, you know, you have a spare tire in your trunk, so to speak, hydraulically. So if if pump A exceeds uh, its life, pump B is ready to perform for you. So so that insurance policy, so to speak, is not a bad one and easy for us to say in the equipment channel, but when you look at the scope and cost of a modern site and, and say the cost adder of buying a second submersible pump, um, a little bit of some additional piping in the sump, and then the additional electrical portion, let's not forget that. Um, it's not free, but you're probably talking, you know, a small number of, 
let's go with maybe a five or six thousand dollar price adder not a sixty thousand dollar price adder and later if if this is missed and it requires rework uh, especially if, let's hope not trenching conduit that could be tremendously disruptive and expensive so so plan for the future build for to, to inhibit for today but think about tomorrow as well now I'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention the subject. Everything we've talked about to this point was fixed speed. Uh, there is available in the market from FE Petro uh, variable speed pumps as well. And sometimes this is a, uh, I don't know, a somewhat sensitive subject. It should be stated for the record. Variable speed pumps are currently only offered by the blue com pump company, not the red one. And let's talk, Frank, about the difference between two horsepower fixed versus variable speed. To start with, we notice it's the same horsepower rating. So for the most part, yes, you know, two horsepower is two horsepower when they're fixed. The difference here that the audience would want to know is that a variable speed pump, whether it's a well pump for water or in this case for fuel, has uh, what's called a variable frequency controller, a VFC, or a variable frequency drive, VFD, that modulates the current, the electricity, and the frequency of this AC electricity going out to the variable speed pump motor. The variable speed is variable. It can go slow-ish or medium-ish or fast-ish. So that range in the case of the FE Petro MAG VFC drive is about 42 cycles per second on the low side to 7070 cycles per second on the high side. So that's quite a bit of variation. And there's more we could say about it. It's not the intent of this presentation about how that pump senses demand and can accelerate itself. But, but the audience will wanna know that Every fixed speed pump in North America, red or blue, runs on our electricity off our grid, which in this country is 60 cycles per second, 60 hertz. Whereas a variable speed pump, we just said, runs from about 42 to 70 hertz. So focus on the top end of that curve electrically, Frank. The boost from 60 hertz to 70 in variable only, that little bit of lift is why now when we study this curve at 60 feet ahead, we don't see the same exact 80 gallons per minute. We actually go up to about 90 because this two horsepower motor is being pushed harder and faster with more cycles per second of electricity to spin it up to speed. So here you get a little bit more or more headroom and it is variable. One of the misnomers in the market is when we talked a moment ago about modern dispensers self-regulating to, to not exceed the 10 GPM, um, that's the ceiling, not the floor. So sometimes people get confused thinking like, uh, well, it doesn't really matter to maybe have variable speed because, um, you know, I'm, I have dispensers that are going to take care of that. And you have to say, time out, think about what you're saying. The dispenser's ability to cap the ceiling has nothing to do with the floor. It doesn't have anything to do with establishing the flow to get to that nozzle in the first place. Said simply, Frank, let's pretend for absurdity. We put a single three-quarter horsepower motor in an eight dispenser, 16 nozzle site. So though those dispensers can self-regulate at 10 GPM or the site-wide, let's call that 160, we already looked at the curve of the three-quarter that's going to top out at 60 feet ahead about 45 GPM. So you could have every every valve, every fully open in every dispenser, um, and you're not going to get more flow out of it. So we want to be careful we don't confuse flow delivery performance with flow capacity. They are the they are different. I hope that's clear. Yeah, crystal clear. Okay. Yeah, and then last but not least, uh, continuing on in the size curve, um, and and uh, uh, I'm no longer an employee of Franklin. Let's say for the record, I I don't have uh, skin in the game there anymore, Frank, as they say. But 
but it is true that FE Petro is unique in the market that they make this four horsepower variable speed and that uh, that motor has its niche as well. So let's look at the flow rate. Uh, and again, I point out, Frank, we just went from two horse variable speed and we saw the 90 gallons per minute, right, at 60 feet. Now we're at four us. It doesn't double, but we increase with that horsepower to about 110 gallons a minute. So we went from 90 to 110. Do the math, the rule of 10, divide by 10. That would tell us this four horse pump could feed about 11 nozzles, typical sight simultaneously, which kind of is close to 12 and gets really good into that six dispenser site with a single submersible pump. And then for those biggest of big sites, if we were to twin the four horse and we came over here, you're gonna see again, that's where it doubles and you basically come up to about 210, 220, it's roughly 2X. That's a lot of flow. Probably wouldn't see that in a gas station unless it's in Texas, uh, but you would potentially see this at a truck stop application or, or a diesel application. So, so the conclusion of that matter is in truck stops that need a lot of flow, um, they're, they're typically looking for 30 gallons per minute per nozzle as opposed to 10, and they run in tandem with um, you know, master and satellite. So a tractor trailer at a truck stops looking for about 60 gallons per minute per lane. Uh, let's say of a four lane truck stop, do the math, Frank, 60 times four is 240 gallons a minute. Um, if, you're, if you're watching through this, this is where you either have to clearly use multiple pumps or in the big flow pumps, not our focus today, the three and five horse fixed speed, those um, have, have traditionally been used but if we, if we were to pull up those curves, maybe in another video, you'd see that the five horsepower pump fixed speed at 60 feet ahead puts out about 200 GPM. And here we see twin four variables put out a little north of that, but more importantly, we have the redundancy. We don't have all our eggs in the five horse basket and five horse pumps are incredibly big and, and, and bulky, uh, requires, uh, most often a crane. Uh, I've seen it wow. done with with some other equipment substituting won't name, uh, but it's quite a service concern. And again, if, if that's your sole pump and it goes down, you're down for the count. So we're working with the market, often encouraging engineers and contractors to consider twin four variable pumps that are four inch pumps instead of a single six inch, very heavy five horsepower. It's all about uh, changing times. Well, Matt, this has been uh, incredibly informational and in in uh, fear of getting into the weeds, I, I would like to ask about the different types of fuels. I got to imagine the viscosity of gasoline versus diesel will uh, definitely change and skew the charts that we're seeing here. And if I'm to assume that's where you're going to tell the customer, get a hold of the manufacturer, be it FE Petro, be it Red Jacket get with them in order to determine what is best for your particular site and the fuel that you're serving. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, Frank. And you could probably guess, uh, I'm going to really probably botch this. I'm not an engineer. Let's make sure everybody knows. But but in a way, the, the greater viscosity, a little bit thicker, the fuel, the, a little easier it is for pump impellers to grab hold of and mm. shove down the line. So you actually, yeah, you know, like a very thin, thin light liquid is a little harder to pump than maybe something a little thicker, but then that can go the other way, if, you know, like if you're trying to draw up you know, gear lube, let's say. So these fuel pumps, it's it's good that you brought that up. And you'll see in the fine print under the curves about the specific gravity is that these curves are published for gasoline. Diesel is slightly different, actually a little bit more efficient, uh, but absolutely go to the manufacturer with your site plan and your 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 equipment list, and they can help you dial in the, the perfect sizing. Um, and since we just brought up diesel, 
we didn't really talk about auto diesel. So I, I would say it's kind of a three horse race, Frank. We we know retail gasoline, we've said it so many times in this video now, 10 gallons a minute, that's your ceiling. Um, there is not a ceiling with diesel and that's because it's not a vapor recovery product. There's no environmental concern about like pushing out excessive diesel vapors while fueling. So diesel is wide open um, and we, we just said for the truck stop flow, but what about filling a, you know, an automobile or a light truck in a, in a four quart environment with diesel? There's not the 10 GPM limit. Many sites will be built with that, um, with 10 PM for the auto diesel as well as the gas but it can be a little bit north of that. So uh, some customers will use one inch hanging hardware and like, you know, bigger nozzles for maybe buses, RVs, and the mid range of trucks, um, like, like landscape and construction work equipment, that kind of thing. So you can work with dispenser manufacturers like Wayne and Gilparco to get a one inch hose outlet on a modern, you know, let's say ovation or encore dispenser and, and, and get a little more diesel flow out of that uh, you know, retail four quart, maybe 15, 18, 20 gallons a minute to give the, the diesel customer a little better experience as well. Gotcha. Okay, uh, so to recap a bit um, and to go back to the beginning of um, this little presentation and, and, and the advice that you gave was to start uh, at, at the end of the fuel line with your dispensers. Um, so if you want to know exactly how to size your fueling station correctly with the right submersible pump, you would take the amount of uh, hoses at your dispensers. We'll say you have 10 hoses and you multiply that by the maximum amount of gallon per minute flow that you need, which is 10. In this instance, that would give you 100 gallons per minute. If you're asking what size pump is that, well, you take that information, you go to either the manufacturer of these pumps or you go to your distributor, your Shields Harper, and ask the question, if I need a 100 gallons per minute flow of gasoline, what size pump is, is that going to be? And those are the questions you need to ask. Am I missing anything there? That's basically it, Frank. Just always remember that magic number of 10 for retail gasoline. Work back from there. And it's so easy to get this right you know, at the beginning and relatively hard and costly to fix it after the concrete is poured. Sure, uh, wise words indeed. Matt Schusler, thank you so much for your time and your insight uh, on this topic. I found it informational. I hope you all did as well. Uh, if you liked this video, please uh, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel uh, where you can find more information uh, just like this. And uh, if you have any questions, concerns, uh, or comments, please use the comment section below. And you can always find us at shieldsharper.com. Matt, thank you again. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Frank.